are joining. Okay, um, so welcome to this online panel on the new uh, on the new Vox EU uh, CEPR ebook on uh, shaping Africa post COVID recovery. I'm uh, Ugo Panizza. I co-edited the book with uh, Raba Areski from the uh, African Development Bank and Simeon Janko from the London School of Economics and the Peterson Institute. Um, I will spend uh, a couple of minutes uh, describing the ebook and introducing the, the panel. And then I will pass the ball to Simeon, who will moderate the panel and the Q&A session. You'll be able to ask a question to the uh, Q&A button. In, uh, in, in the Zoom. So let me start uh, with the background of this project. Uh, a few months ago, Simeon and I edited a CPR ebook on um, COVID in developing countries, we, which in turn was inspired by two very uh, successful ebooks edited by uh, Richard Baldwin and uh, Beatrice Veder Di Mauro. Uh, and since uh, the books by Richard and Beatrice mostly focused on the situation in advanced economies, uh, we thought it would be good to have a, a something focusing on, on the developing world. And by the way, all these ebooks can be uh, downloaded for free from the uh, CEPR VOXEU websites. After the, the ebook on COVID in developing countries came out, uh, we talked, uh, Simeon and I started having a conversation with Raba, who had just been appointed as a chief economist of the African Development Bank. And we thought it would be important to have another ebook with a, a specific focus on Africa. And, uh, and we decided to focus on Africa for several reasons. One reason is that while the continent uh, has so far been mostly spared from the worst direct health effect of the, of the pandemic, even though unfortunately things are getting worse, uh, the, African, the African economy has been uh, hurt significantly by the pandemic. And Africa is of particular concern because uh, it's the continent with the highest prevalence of extreme poverty. And, uh, and some estimates suggest that, uh, that Africa will be responsible for about one third of the increase in extreme poverty uh, associated with the pandemic. So what they thought would, we thought it would be important to focus uh, on this uh, continent. Uh, the ebook is very rich. It has uh, 14 chapters which focus on, on firms and household responses, on FDI, on the role of state on enterprises, on tourism, on food security, on the role of development banks, on Chinese lending to Africa, on sovereign debt risk. And it also includes a few country studies going from Ethiopia to Egypt to uh, South Africa and Namibia. So uh, given the, the richness, there is no way I can summarize this in a few minutes, but we are lucky today that we have some of the authors with us, which will be able to uh, provide us with the perspective, uh, with their perspectives on, on some of the issues that we discuss in the ebook. So let me just quickly mention who is here with us today, and then uh, I'll pass the ball to, uh, to Simeon. So, uh, Simeon will be will be chairing the panel, and then uh, our third editor, Raba Areski, is also with us. Uh, with, as I mentioned, is the chief economist uh, of the African Development Bank. Uh, then we have uh, Deborah Brotigam from uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Advanced and International Studies. Deborah is the leading authority on, uh, among other things, on Chinese lending to Africa. Uh, we have Ariana Legovini, who is the leader of the Development Impact Evaluation Group at the, at the World Bank, and uh, Amelia Santos Paulino, who leads uh, FDI research at UNCTAD. So let me uh, now give the floor to Simeon. Thank you very much, Hugo. We have an exciting uh, panel. And again, the book is already available uh, online for free at um, CPR and Vox EU. So you can. Um, uh, look at it as we uh, speak. Uh, we have decided to invite uh, four of the uh, main contributors to the volume uh, that represent quite different uh, parts of the book um, uh, so that um, 
uh, you get a sense of the depth uh, in the book to remind you we look at uh, the impact of COVID uh, in Africa on households, on uh, firms, uh, and also how governments and international institutions have, um, have responded so far and what remains to be done. Uh, we will follow the alphabetical order. So Rabo will speak uh, first, followed by Deborah, Rihanna, and uh, Amelia. And I ask uh, for about six to eight minute uh, presentations at first. Uh, and then for the chat, uh, please, you can send already questions. I will um, uh, look at them as, uh, as we go through the presentations and then direct them to the, um, to the authors of, uh, of this uh, wonderful volume. So Rabo, you're first, um, please, the yep. floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much, Simeon. Great to be with you all. Uh, let me begin with a brief uh, uh, take on, on the economic outlook for, for the continent since uh, from my vantage point, vantage point here, yeah, it's really what, what, what's keeping me busy and uh, I'll try and uh, weighing some of the insight from the, from the chapter as, uh, as, uh, as I go. So the outlook is very much uncertain. There are three factors uh, that are really going to determine the economic and social development for, for the years to come. These uh, three factors are vaccine, debt, and commodities. Uh, take vaccines. Access and inoculation of vaccine will not only determine when we achieve herd immunity, and hence when the continent can truly be reopened for business, including to restart a sector which has been devastated, the tourism sector. One of the chapter in this ebook delve into the issue of, of tourism and uh, using big data analysis with a comparison with the uh, SARS epidemic. Uh, unequal access to vaccine between the continent and the rest of the world, as well as unequal access within the continent would be a challenge to be reckoned with. Whether, whether it is for vaccine distribution or other form of relief, eradicating leakages is part of the governance apparatus that COVID has highlighted as foundational. Let me now turn to the issue of, uh, of debt. Default on debt obligation are likely to accelerate this year because of the exhausted fiscal and monetary buffers. Avoiding debt overhang and ensuring orderly uh, debt resolution are the priorities uh, for the road ahead. The G20 common framework provides much needed hope for bilateral official debt relief as well as private creditor relief on comparable terms. But coordination at the regional and global level would be essential. In that, uh, in that uh, ebook, again, we, we have a chapter looking at, uh, at the role of, uh, of regional and, and multilateral uh, uh, development institution. And in, in that context, the, the issue of debt is, is, uh, is, a, is very much looming. And one of the very issues that's keeping me busy at the moment is, is the fact that uh, certain rating agencies have threatened uh, uh, individual country, including uh, some in the continent, that if they were to approach the G20 uh, to enter in that common framework, they'll be downgrading. And, and this in turn might affect the uh, standing, the financial standing, the rating of these very development institution. So those are uh, some of the very uh, uh, tense uh, situation that the development on, on the debt front uh, uh, will lead to and, and clearly uh, reducing the firing power of development institution in the midst of such crisis would, would be uh, devastating and much more costly uh, than if uh, uh, they are empowered. Yet they need to uh, obviously uh, do uh, things better than they need to go more upstream when it comes to uh, acting on, on reforms, uh, leveraging uh, regionalization uh, agenda, a private sector fixing financial system. So all the issues that are, are discussed in, in, uh, in one of the chapter on rethinking development banking. Uh, uh, critically, the, the continent would need to also uh, um, do its share and uh, the nexus between governance and growth uh, would provide the right paradigm uh, to align debtors and, and creditor incentive. And only through growth can we uh, provide this systematic and orderly uh, debt resolution. And, and clearly the debt uh, development banks, uh, including regional ones, can play a critical role in ensuring uh, through conditionality, through the, the policy engagement, ensure that, that growth restarts and that the governance uh, that comes with it is also uh, on track. Uh, not everything is grim, however. The commodity prices are on the rise. Uh, there is a start of, uh, of, a, of a potentially a commodity super cycle 
which is due to a conjunction of factors ranging from on the demand side from a, a strong Asian recovery uh, due to a big uh, also big on the demand side a big U.S. stimulus that's uh, been announced and um, and uh, but there's also shortages on the supply side that are due to to the lack of investment in, in the commodity sector. That super cycle might be the last uh, for oil, considering the commitment of major economy to do away with fossil fuel. An appropriate governance framework to manage the proceeds of commodities in good and bad time is a top priority uh, if we want to diversify the economies in, in the continent and create the much needed job. These are all the very important issues uh, that uh, are, are dwelled into uh, uh, this, this book. And uh, they are also just an illustration of the breadth and depth of, of issues to be reckoned with in the years ahead. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Rabo. And just to note that uh, yesterday there were international news that the first vaccines uh, organized by COVAX uh, reached uh, Ghana, I think. So you'll tell us uh, later what you think about the speed of vaccination and how this affects some of your uh, economic prospects. Um, Deborah next. Deborah, this is probably the most uh, controversial and eagerly anticipated uh, chapter in, uh, in, uh, in the book. Um, uh, and you're known, known for strong opinions uh, so on this, among other topics. So please uh, tell us how you see um, the uh, more recent developments around, around COVID and China in Africa, but maybe even beyond COVID, given what Rabba just mentioned, that uh, the Chinese economy seems to have recovered relatively quickly and may have a more aggressive tone in the rest of the world too, or not. Uh, thanks, Simeon. I'm going to stick in my remarks right now to the chapter that is uh, in the book, and then we can talk about the other things during the Q&A. Um, but just to give an outline, there has been a lot of interest in Chinese lending in Africa and other parts of the world uh, in recent years, as debt worries have started to enlarge. And um, Africa is a prime place for this. And when the COVID-19 crisis hit, the fears of a new debt crisis exploding um, had started to become more and more real. And so this interest in Chinese lending, I think is, is often not based on, I mean, the interest is very real, but the analysis is not always based on, on facts. And so what we've done in this paper, and fortunately we've been able to take advantage not only of our research at Johns Hopkins University on Chinese lending, where we have a database of over a thousand loans that we've been tracking um, from 2000 to 2018. Uh, but the World Bank has released um, a new data set uh, from the International Debt Statistics, which uh, specifies Chinese debt and other lenders, lender by lender in Africa. I mean, uh, country by country, not lender by lender. And, and that's an important distinction that I'll talk about in a moment. And so uh, from that, we can really see um, the facts on how China compares as a lender compared to others in Africa. So let me brief you a little bit on that. Um, from 2000 to 2018, uh, in, in our data, um, which includes all of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, the World Bank's data so far on their um, interface at their website is just the countries that are low income plus Angola. So our data uh, shows 133 billion in Chinese loan commitments across Sub-Saharan Africa. But these loan commitments do not, they're not the same as debt because some have been repaid, some haven't been dispersed, and that's an important distinction. And people are always <laughs> looking at our, our website and saying, oh, this is Chinese debt in Africa, but it's not. Um, and Angola takes up 32% of these loan commitments. And that's a, a, a good example of why the uh, figures that we have are not the same as debt, because Angola has repaid a lot of this and not, and not all of it has been dispersed. So out of 43 billion loan commitments to Angola, right now Angola's debt is about 22 billion. And so that's, a, that's an important distinction. So uh, Chinese official debt in 2019, and now I'm going to the World Bank statistics because they have the relative figures, was 19% of public and publicly guaranteed debt in these poor countries, the 38 poor countries. And the World Bank made up 23% and other multilaterals totaled up 43%. So the Chinese are, are a, a big factor, but there are other very significant lenders in that landscape. 
So when we look at debt servicing, however, because most of the, uh, the Chinese lending in places like Angola is commercial. And so Angola takes up nearly half of all of the Chinese debt servicing costs for 2020. And so that's a significant, um, and Angola is very, so they loom large in this landscape of Chinese lending. And that's a thing that people often don't look at when they just look at, oh, China takes up 19% of all of this. But a big chunk of that is Angola. Um, and another complicating factor is that uh, we tend to, especially, well, I would say we here because I'm not among this, but people often tend to look at China as, as one single entity. You know, China's doing this, China's doing that. But one of the things that we try to emphasize in, in our work is that it's really important to disaggregate China. It's important to disaggregate China in general because as political scientists talk about China, it's a fragmented authoritarian system. It's not as though there's Xi Jinping sitting in Beijing and he's calling all the shots and everything. It's a very complicated place. He couldn't possibly do that. Um, but when it comes to lending, we have in the Africa database and we're unique in this because nobody else has been tracking this. We have over 30 individual lenders that have lent around the continent. And where this becomes particularly difficult is in negotiating debt relief. So in, a, in the two countries, uh, interestingly, the two countries that we profile in the chapter, there are also two countries that have been in the news a lot uh, recently with regard to Chinese debt negotiations and debt relief negotiations, Angola and Zambia. And one of the interesting things that, that uh, we've noticed as we've been analyzing our data uh, and looking at debt relief is that there were 15 different Chinese lenders in Zambia and 10 different Chinese lenders in Angola. And so all of this really complicates uh, getting down to um, brass tacks in terms of doing debt relief because you're not just dealing with one official bilateral creditor. So the Chinese have uh, distinguished two of their creditors as official bilateral creditors. And that is China Exim Bank, their export credit agency, and SIDCA, which is the China International Development Cooperation Agency, which provides their um, zero interest loans, their grants. Uh, so there are two different windows there. And those are part of the G20 debt service suspension initiative. And they're also part of the common framework, but that leaves all those other lenders outside. And so the last uh, part that I'll, uh, the last thing that I'll say is that what we are seeing, like uh, I think it's pretty much the case with any other commercial lenders in Africa, uh, some of these Chinese commercial lenders have been participating in debt relief. And so we see this in Angola where we've got Chinese uh, China Development Bank and Industrial and Commercial Bank of China having provided debt relief to Angola. We see this in Zambia with China Development Bank having provided debt relief. This debt relief is not the same as the debt uh, terms under the G20 debt service suspension initiative, uh, but it, it is significant debt relief and it takes place, it's suspending um, uh, principal payments um, for a, a significant, for up to I think three years in some of these cases. So we can talk about the details on that, but I'll say just my last words, which is that um, the common framework is, has potential, but so far there's really no, uh, mechanism to bring the private creditors into this common framework. So the Chinese are the only ones that are that I can see where the Chinese government is bringing their so-called private creditors into the debt relief in Africa and nobody else is doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. In fact, uh, some questions are already coming as to the private part of the debt relief and what does the, the last point you made. So this would be a question to you. Simeon, there are problems with the with the connection, so maybe I'll take over for a minute uh, and uh, I, I'll give the the floor to Ariana, and then hopefully we'll be able to recover uh, Simeon soon. Ariana, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a little shifting gear. Uh, a dime we have feet on the ground um, across a large number of developing countries. And I've been building data capabilities as part of our country research programs and field experiments. 
And it is on this basis that um, during the COVID crisis, we launched several research activities to generate real-time evidence for countries to manage and respond to the crisis. And so what we have learned in this process is that um, research presence on the ground and investments in data are necessary as if as a research community, we really want to contribute in real time to support uh, countries in during crisis. One area of work that we have focused on are disruptions in food security, uh, sorry, in food uh, security supply chains, um, especially you know, thinking about um, the effects of the pandemic and social distancing policies and, and uh, uh, worrying about the you know, permanent consequences of malnutrition on human development. Uh, together with my colleagues, Taeyong Jong and Sarza Jonyan, uh, we were able to exploit pre-crisis household surveys in five countries, Nigeria, Mali, Chad, Malawi, and Uganda, and combined them with um, phone surveys to create panel data. Uh, we use the panel data to investigate the effects of the crisis on food security. And of course, um, even though the pandemic uh, led to unprecedented economic crisis as very widely reported. To our surprise, we find that these projections of spikes in food insecurities were actually not realized in most of the context we analyzed. Um, in fact, food security remained very stable or improved in both urban and rural areas in all contexts with the notable exception of Nigeria, where uh, food uh, insecurity increased by a staggering 25% uh, percentage points. Um, this, of course, is associated with the falling global demand for oil on which Nigeria's economy relies so heavily. In fact, about 80% of its export and 50% of government revenue from the oil sector um, are, I'm sorry, are, um, <clears throat> are um, from, the from the oil sector and the falling in global demand hit hard both its economy and its fiscal capacity. I think more generally factors such as um, the underlying structure of these economies and the nature of covariance shocks might have either deepened or averted the crisis, at least on food security. A country like Malawi, the opposite end of the spectrum, um, fairly insulated from global markets, relied on its recent gains in agricultural productivity and reduced its food insecurity levels by a large and significant 10 percentage points in 2020. Um, of course, we should not uh, conclude that the pandemic had no effects on these economies or the food security is not a concern. First, the level of food security is extremely high, even prior to the COVID crisis, from 30% in Mali and Uganda, 50% in Nigeria, 80% plus in Chad and Malawi. So this is obviously a very important um, issue that requires urgent attention. Um, and second, about 40% of survey respondents um, identify uh, or claim report significant losses of agricultural, non-agricultural income and remittances. And these losses in income might have delayed effects on food security. Uh, in addition, loss of employment seems quite important, especially in the private sector. In uh, the industrial park of Awasa in Ethiopia, we find that 41% of low income and mostly female workers have lost their jobs. In Rwanda, my colleagues Florence Condilis and John Lozers and others um, partner with the fiscal authority to understand the impact of the pandemic and find a K-shaped recovery path across sectors and industries, both on employment and turnover. So they used um, high frequency tax data on sales and employment to show that aggregate shock peaked, peaked in April 2020 with the full recovery uh, by September, but with marked differences across sectors. Um, actually kind of a three-prong um, recovery where face-to-face -face sectors like food and accommodation um, are facing a protracted slowdown while um, manufacturing, wholesale and retail uh, seem to be um, back to pre-COVID levels and construction uh, displaying high growth uh, relative to pre-COVID levels. So even as the lockdowns are removed and in-person work resumes, sectors that rely on face-to-face -face interactions might continue to suffer disproportionately from the crisis and might require policy support at least until uh, vaccines become widely available. Uh, yes, some vaccines were delivered uh, this week, but uh, some estimates uh, look at you know, coverage uh, only being 
uh, really achieved around 2023. Uh, I think what, what is interesting about this study um, is that it demonstrates that administrative tax data allows uh, for more granular analyses and a higher frequencies um, than traditional national accounts, and therefore can serve as a tool for monitoring economies during crisis and targeting a demand stimulus. I, I would say, um, just to conclude, that there are three things that uh, clearly um, uh, we, sh we need to worry about. One are investments of this demand stimulus in uh, sectors um, that, you know, um, that respond to the crisis directly, increasing safety in health facilities and, and uh, schools. The other is supporting the sectors that are really not recovering because of the protracted um, uh, impact from face-to-face -face interaction. But third, and, and perhaps kind of just throwing it out there, kind of taking the opportunity uh, of all the uh, lending, and especially kind of development lending to focus on uh, getting these economies ready for uh, the Green Revolution. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ariana. Um, Deborah, some questions are already coming uh, on uh, China, if you have a chance to look at them uh, while we continue with uh, Amelia, we will... Um, start with you on the next round of, uh, of questions. Amelia, one of the topics that uh, is much discussed among policymakers in Africa is that now that there is uh, so much uh, need for public finances, um, maybe FDI is the answer for many of these countries, so foreign investors will help uh, in the recovery. Uh, your chapter focuses precisely on this uh, topic, latest trends. Can you please elaborate? Thank you so much and thank you for having us. And I think it's important not only to discuss the role of investment on uh, productive capacities and sustainable recovery, but also how this affect, I mean, how the shock that the pandemic represented affect the prospects of mobilizing resources to meet the SDGs. We are in, uh, I think, in a two prone avenue towards uh, one towards recovery and the other to maintain the momentum that was gained before the the pandemic hit in terms of investing in sustainable development goal sectors. And I will come back to, to this a bit later. I mean, it's undeniable that FDI remains an important component and an important source of development finance for developing countries. In fact, developing countries represent 70% of uh, global FDI flows, despite the lower rates of African, in this, uh, African countries in this chair. But we know that if the item to be more stable and contribute to broader development objectives than other sources of finance. So the fact that the impact of COVID was so severe on FDI uh, raises concerns, as I mentioned, not only on sustainability, but also on investing on productive capacities on the countries uh, in, the, in the African continent. So we show as part of the trends, we try to see what happened uh, as a result of COVID and the, the main impact was a decline of around 50% of global FDI flows across the, across the world. And uh, in Africa, this was particularly harder than in other developing countries. We saw that FDI inflows into Africa declined around 20% in comparison to other developing countries where the decline was around uh, 12%. This decline was more pronounced in the North Africa a region, and as um, other panelists mentioned, this was due mostly to the dynamic in the commodity markets and in the oil uh, markets. So basically, uh, this has implication not only for the flows of resources, but also for the uh, trade prospects of the of the continent. And uh, as we see, some of this investment, and I will come back to to this uh, finance important infrastructure sectors. So basically here we see that, okay, there was a, a decline, but, and the decline was, was bigger, but is there any hope? Is there any sign of, um, of positive outlook in the, despite the crisis? So what we did was to try to look at different types of foreign investment. So what we did was we zoom in into two major flows 
One is the greenfield, what we call greenfield investment, because the, these uh, investment components are important for building productive capacity. And also we look into, uh, and also it's an indicator, an important indicator of cross-border projects and also allow us to project what is the intention of foreign investors in the medium term, shorter and medium term. So we try to look at what happened in terms of greenfield investment project and also international project finance. And here I come back to the development and sustainable development dimension because um, project finance is one of the main sources of investment for very large scale infrastructure projects. Before Deborah mentioned the, the issue of lending uh, to the continent, but also infrastructure investment through project finance remains as one of the most important because uh, this is how MEs finance projects requiring multiple investors and multiple lenders. So it's important to look at this, um, especially from a longer term perspective. So uh, what we found is that these projects mostly, because of the nature, uh, mostly target infrastructure. So we couldn't grasp so much the social dimension of the, of the impact there. So basically, uh, the chapter shows that unfortunately the pandemic is severely affecting both sources of foreign investment into the continent. That is the greenfield projects and the, um, that is most broadly productive capacity and the project finance. And greenfield fell by around 68% in the continent as a result of the pandemic. And I mean, this, uh, if we compare to other developing regions like Latin America, a similar shock was observed, especially in countries that are um, that are uh, highly specialized on natural resources and commodities. So uh, this is uh, one of the the key issues of concern when looking at this at this impact. The other issue is that um, I mean, despite the negative shock, what we tried to to do was to look okay, what happened then with SDG sectors. And by SDG sectors, what we, we develop a methodology at OMTAD to try to group productive sectors according to the SDG, SDG sectors. It was impossible to have data for the 17 goals. So basically we try to look across sectors that include power, infrastructure, telecommunication, water and sanitation, food and agriculture, climate change and mitigation, a, an adaptation, which is very important for the development and sustainable development perspective, ecosystem, health, and education. So despite the negative overall shock that we saw on FDI into Africa, the investment into SDG sector, the negative impact was less severe. And basically this has to do because of the large investment in renewables. So if we want a piece of good news, this is a piece of, piece of good news here. I mean, the, the role that the investment of renewables uh, in the continent basically counterbalance the negative impact in other sectors. Uh, but see, I, as I said, I mean, if you compare um, the fall in greenfield in manufacturing investment was around 50, 51%, whereas in project finance into SDG it was lower. It was around 40%. So, uh, in terms of the number of projects, but the renewable sector, as I already mentioned, experienced an increase of almost 60% due to the large projects in the renewable energy industry in the continent. Whether this is good in the, has a good development impact in the longer term, it still needs a, a little bit more of analysis and the dependency on this type of investment. Uh, I mean, at the, the issue here is what are the ramifications, not only in terms of overall development, but also in terms of export promotion and industrialization. We are now facing a, a, a prospect that only sectors related to infrastructure, large infrastructure projects are experiencing a positive uh, drive from FDI. But what happened with the, with the rest of the economy and what happened with other, uh, with other productive sectors? Still, despite the, the negative shock and despite the challenges, we think that there are opportunities still for diversification through value chain in the city, value chains in the in the continent, especially because of the opportunities that the new African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, 
uh, allows and afford. And if we if we account in an efficient and successful implementation, especially of the investment chapters uh, of the agreement and on a political will to to efficiently implement the agreement, then there are prospects for efficiency seeking FDI in the continent. Still, Africa participation in global evaluation remains significantly below the potential. So what we try to do is to see the role of foreign direct investment to boost this participation, this lower participation, and also how the restructuring of global value chain due to integration can help. And I mean, we, we did some analysis in the World Investment Report in 2020, looking what are the possible trajectories that were already taking place due to the international global uh, situation, the sustainability imperative, technological, technological change, and so on. And then COVID hit. COVID came on top of the existing trends. Uh, and now the question is, what is the role for FDI? And what are the opportunities to attract FDI in the continent in the context of all the challenges and in the context of the opportunities that the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement provide? So basically, here we move from Okay, investment in uh, productive capacities, investment into SDG sectors, and then investment into diversification and transformation and how the Continental Free Trade Agreement will help. And uh, I know the 10 minutes to make the link is not easy, but the, the key message here is that the agreement provides the opportunity for attract, attracting investment and also to promote coordinated efforts, as Rabat mentioned earlier on in his introduction, coordinating efforts not only among governments, but also among stakeholders across multiple dimensions. Um, then, uh, I mean, I already went through the, through the link and how uh, the, the agreement can help to mobilize and to, to mobilize efficiency seeking uh, for indirect investment. But the question is, what is the role for policy? And, and here, one of the concerns in the context of COVID was that we saw an increase in, uh, as part of all the policy packages uh, implemented during the pandemic, there was an increase in uh, investment measures that affected the mobilization of investment towards uh, developing countries. And this type of protectionism is a bit uh, of concern in the policy arena. So uh, there were this one in the policy, one of the policy issues that I would like to, to flag. The other issue is the, as I mentioned, what opportunities in terms of regional integration and what opportunities for a successful implementation. And finally, another question is how the, as I mentioned, how the, the global economy uh, can react to help African countries not to derail from the, from the process of achieving the, the sustainable development goal. Again, prudent and coordinated policy measures are important, especially investment policy measures. Usually in the global um, development finance debate, we tend to focus mostly on macro, on official development assistance, but uh, investment policy measures also are important in this context. I think I will stop here. I'm happy to, to go back to one of the, one of the issues in the in the Q and A sector, but uh, just to conclude, if there is a piece of news, renewables help to sort of uh, counterbalance the big negative impact of the pandemic on foreign direct investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilia. Um, so we start with the questions now. Uh, let me first ask a vaccine question. Both Raba and Ariana mentioned vaccines being very important. We have the first uh, uh, contribution of the COVAX, but in brief, are we optimistic that uh, there are going to be enough vaccines this year? Who is financing these vaccines? And then we'll go to Deborah and some questions on, uh, on uh, China as to is the debt that you are mentioning mostly secured or is it unsecured? Uh, how does it fit within the DSSI uh, agenda that you already mentioned? That would be the next set of questions. Rabo, then Ariana, please. Thank you. No, so the, the short answer is no, not optimistic. And uh, this reminds me very much of, uh, of the food crisis uh, that we witnessed in 2011, where there was hoarding on the part of producing country 
And uh, in the case of vaccines, similarly, many advanced economies are actually buying way more uh, vaccine than they need. And then there's the issue of uh, the, that we mentioned in the book of the temporal lifting of, uh, of patent uh, for, for the production of generic uh, uh, vaccine. And this is an issue that many advanced economies are opposing, uh, uh, you know, vividly. And, um, you know, going forward, uh, you know, front loading, the inoculation of vaccine is going to be critical. Vaccinating, uh, vaccinating here and there uh, at a very slow pace might actually be self-defeating in many ways. So, uh, you know, lots of resources are needed. COVAX is, uh, is, is helping, but this is, is 20%, uh, uh, you know, will likely reach 20% uh, when, when it comes due of, of the population. To reach herd immunity, you probably need at least 60%. So uh, not optimistic, a lot more uh, to be done and, and maybe uh, also related to the chapter on FDI, clearly their production, domestic production, lifting the, 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 the patenting uh, could, could be a way, a way forward to produce in the continent a massive, uh, a massive amount. Uh, so, so those are uh, some of the issues on the table, but, uh, but, but really not looking, uh, not looking great. And, and that will hamper the recovery of, uh, of Africa and, uh, and growth uh, going forward, including the tourism sector. Thank you, Rabba. Ariana, something to mention, given that you, your team also studies rural versus urban, um, what are the differences there? And generally also on the household side. How do you see vaccines and their contribution to a recovery? Well, clearly, so what we see in, in the case of Rwanda, but this has been documented in many other cases, we have a K-shaped recovery, clearly with face-to-face, -face, um, with sectors that require face-to-face -face, uh, contact with consumers, not recovering at the same rate as other sectors. So kind of the, the vaccines become, sent, you know, completely central to the idea of, uh, you know, having more balanced recovery path. And I, I kind of, I agree with Rabat that the idea that Africa will, you know, very quickly uh, reach vaccination levels that are necessary for this is uh, probably not the case. And that we need to be uh, creative in, in finding both uh, kind of regulatory and fiscal space to, to at least allow the, um, governments in these countries to have a proper response. One, one area I think which is quite interesting of um, in, uh, in uh, you know, using micro data, transaction level data from procurement agencies and working with procurement agencies to uh, increase the efficiency in the procurement function, uh, especially in this pharmaceutical um, uh, procurement and really um, Kind of both create the space, but also find ways of uh, using the procurement function to provide uh, um, demand, demand incentives for their own private sectors to, to produce. In, in the specific case of Rwanda, we looked at the face mask uh, manufacturing in Rwanda. The government reacted very quickly, providing space for and, uh, and support for uh, manufacturers to shift or for to face mask, um, face masks, and that sector grew very quickly during the crisis and very successfully. So there, I think there is quite a bit of space if we are a little innovative um, in uh, in ways to help Africa help itself, and not only kind of thinking from the global level what we can do for for them. Thank you, Ariana. Now to Deborah. Um, Two questions were posed on the panel and actually on the chat as well. Secured versus unsecured, are they secured by natural resources? What does this mean for the, for the recovery? DSSI, you already mentioned private versus public, maybe you can elaborate. And I also add a, a third question, which is that as we are entering this COVID crisis, there was some speculation that because China is hard hit, they would pull out of China, or at least not be as uh, active as they were before. Now they seem to be recovering faster than uh, much of the rest of the world. Does that mean that they're going to be as uh, active or even perhaps more active than they've been in the recent uh, past, Deborah? 
Uh, thank you. Let me add something on the vaccine front, because um, one of the things that's happening right now also is that the Chinese um, have been not vaccinating a lot of people in China, but <laughs> been exporting vaccines to, to Africa. So this is going to be, I think, a diplomatic um, move and a diplomatic triumph for the Chinese who are, who are not, who are doing the opposite. <laughs> They're not hoarding. They're rather not vaccinating at home and, um, and sending them off. So we'll see how that plays out. So uh, in terms of the, the questions that have come up so far, um, hi, Danny Bradlow. Thank you for that question about uh, the Chinese lending being secured or unsecured. Last year, we published a, a briefing paper on our data, and we're going to be updating that in at the end of March, um, where we have a we will be releasing our 2019 data and our preliminary 2020 data on Chinese lending. So we will be discussing that soon. Um, but in the data that we had for last year up through 2018. 25% of all of the loan commitments in our data were secured by natural resource exports of one kind or another, or by the revenues from those natural resource exports. So that's, um, it's a lower percentage than many people have been saying, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's it, that is the percentage that we can see. And there may be some deals that are outside of that, but I don't think very many. I think we've caught pretty much most of, most of those. But I wanna say that Angola, again, you know, it's the, the sui generis, um, huge, uh, elephant in the middle of the room. Angola makes up 75% of all of that resource secured lending in our data. And the other countries, so therefore the other countries are only 6% so of all of the resource secured loans. So it's Angola is the, the, dominant, um, the dominant one and nine other countries. So aside from, from them. So, and there is, there are some, loans that we're not sure about, which makes up the, the rest of that variance there. So the other security though, that the Chinese uh, lenders ask for is government guarantees. So, you know, that's how most lending is done in Africa with a government guarantee, but they also recognize that that's not, <laughs> it's not necessarily worth that much. And then they have Sinosure, the, Sino, the Chinese um, Export Credit Insurance Agency. And so that's a hefty premium in some cases that the borrower has to pay. And that's another security for the Chinese lender. So the second question was on, on the different Chinese lenders and particularly China Development Bank. So we've also discussed this in a paper that we published in June last year on Chinese de um, debt relief in comparative and historical perspective. But it's interesting, the, the nature of uh, China Development Bank, there's been a lot of controversy about this and David Malpass at the World Bank has been, um, I think most vocal in talking about how China Development Bank should be part of the DSSI. And the Chinese have, uh, have not agreed with that. They have, uh, and there was no uh, official negotiation about which lenders were going to be considered official bilateral lenders before that the DSSI was launched. And it all happened very quickly. So um, they have included those two creditors that I mentioned. So China Development Bank is, is interesting because they were commercialized in 2008. So they do have a status of being a commercial bank. But then um, they were pulled after the global financial crisis or just it happened right at that time, they were pulled back in and the government started using them more as a policy bank again, as they had always been in the past. So now they have a kind of a, a bifurcated status. They are a commercial bank and they operate like a commercial bank overseas most of the time, <laughs> um, but they do have, they are more subject to policy um, than the others. So, so I actually think they should be an official bilateral creditor, but the Chinese government disagrees. And we note in our paper that Germany has made the same decision with the KFX IPEX. They're also not, even though they're state owned, they're not considered an official bilateral creditor and they're not participating in the G20 uh, effort. So China's not the only one doing that. Very interesting comparison. Uh, thank you, Deborah. We'll come back uh, to you with uh, some of the discussion of what the recovery means uh, for continued uh, China presence in, uh, in Africa. Uh, I go to Amelia uh, next. Amelia, there are two questions for you in the Q&A. One is to elaborate a bit on the trade dimension of the regional agreements that you mentioned. Do you see uh, uh, trade on the continent uh, picking up as a result of various constraints outside, but also this agreement. 
and then a question uh, regarding your comments on uh, renewable investments. Where are these investments coming from? Is there some uh, information of countries that invest in uh, or uh, sectors or, or countries that invest? And then we'll go to Raba and Ariana uh, again. There are questions that um, uh, both of you may have views on uh, what does it mean aid in the recovery? So what should be the focus of institutions, international or regional development uh, uh, agencies? Uh, I should note that Rabba needs to step out in about uh, 10 minutes or so. So Rabba, also, if you have some other thoughts that you would like to add. But first, Amelia, please. Thank you so much for the question. I think, I mean, as I mentioned, it's very, it's very interesting that uh, it was brought in the in the Q and A because if you look at the at the at the data, and uh, I already alluded to that, the chairs of Intra Africa trade and uh, Africa GBC participation outside the continent remains very low. Sometimes even, uh, I mean, if you look at the outside the community, extra-regional trade has historically outpaced the intra-regional intra trade often by 90% or more. So the intra-regional uh, exchange of goods and services and also in, of investment is very low in comparison to traditional partners that uh, trade through the different uh, long established agreements like economic partnerships agreements and so on. So, uh, Europe still remains the, the main uh, block, the main trading partner. So the hope is that with implementation of uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and the different um, sub-regional agreements could help to, to increase these shares intra, of intra-regional trade. Um, I mean, the, what opportunities present the pandemic? There, I think the question, there was also part of the question of uh, whether the pandemic will help to restructure or to shift uh, global value chains. Um, the, I mean, the opportunity presents itself as long as developing economies in the continent can access previously restricted value chains and uh, value chains that had very high barrier to entry. So as long as this agreement can help to, to lift this, uh, this uh, market access and bar uh, barrier to entries, then um, there is an opportunity for that. Um, the, other, um, the other question about the, the sectors uh, into renewable of Africa, uh, let me just look at try to get the, the other part of the question. Okay, so what are the sources? Mostly is developed countries. Uh, the Where does it come from? Yes. Come from mostly developed countries. And uh, if you see some of the main uh, initiatives, even post pandemic, were from large countries like United States, uh, United Kingdom, and France, but also China. And uh, more or less the the pattern of investment uh, on project finance from China uh, is uh, mirrors the pattern of lending and other and other type of flows into into the continent. So it's mostly large uh, developed uh, developed countries and and China will be the main the main sources going into 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 renewable. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Emilia. Um, so, Raba and then Ariana, aid. Should, what should uh, development aid agencies focus on in the coming uh, months, maybe years? And then we'll go back to Deborah on the vaccine diplomacy. Several people are interested in the comment that you made. Maybe you can elaborate a bit, uh, Deborah. And then in the recovery, do you see an accelerating role of uh, China? How do you see it post, uh, uh, post COVID? Raba, then Ariana. Thank you uh, very briefly. So on the first, uh, first on the positive side, so I, I expect a lot more reluctance uh, by traditional donors and a lot more scrutiny on uh, on aid by traditional donors. Uh, not sure about China, but uh, Deborah can tell us. On, on the normative side, I um, you know the, the, this is an opportunity for emphasizing the importance of uh, governance uh, system shift. Uh, that are important for, for the continent, but also regionalizing some of the institutional arrangement uh, and, and pushing for regionalization. And a, a lot more of the agenda that we've heard a lot uh, in, in, uh, in development institutions, but that does not really lead to concrete uh, result on uh, private sector development, on upstream reform, 
uh, and basically, uh, you know, the agenda on on, uh, on catalyzing FDI. So I'll stop here and uh, thank, thank you all. Uh, uh, I would love to run. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi Rihanna, please. Yeah, from my side, I see um, uh, three things that would be uh, a priority for uh, support from uh, development organizations in addition to kind of the more macro uh, issues that um, Rabbi spoke about, including the debt. Um, but from, from um, so the first is uh, safety. Uh, our work on uh, uh, health facility safety uh, shows that the level of safety in uh, African facilities is extremely low. In the case of Kenya, we found that at baseline, only 3% of facilities were minimally compliant with health safety standards. So kind of looking forward uh, and taking the opportunity to invest in future um, management of pandemics and uh, in even managing the current uh, levels of healthcare in Africa, I think this is one area where we really need to invest. And the second, um, the kind of the social protection uh, of households slash the support to industries that are suffering uh, inordinately through the crisis. And here, you know, the discussion in, in the States kind of combines a tar targeted approach to a more widely um, you know, a very generous support to the whole economy. But in, in the case of Africa, I think we will need to be quite targeted uh, and very uh, careful on making sure that the funds that we, that the um, governments put out are most effective in supporting the recovery. And so kind of the use of micro data, tax data and others to really target those resources well um, is uh, critical. And, and the last, uh, and I'm very actually um, interested in what Amelia had to say in terms of the FDI. I think this is really, really excellent news. Uh, and again, crises are opportunities as well. Uh, of course, they, they, you know, we suffer a lot through them, but at the same time, kind of reaching bottom th sometimes is um, an opportunity to kind of move in a different direction and kind of a systemic supporting African countries transition to uh, and be more prepared for more sustainable uh, and climate consistent growth uh, would be um, my third priority in this area. And really think, think this goes together with those um, trade agreements and thinking about policies that incentivize um, countries to move away from uh, very damaging um, practices such as, you know, deforestation, especially of peat forest, uh, kind of thinking about tariff structures that help us all transition globally in a coordinated and consistent fashion that um, I'll put that as my third priority. Thank you, Oriana. Uh, Deborah, next. Um, so you mentioned vaccine diplomacy. Is there more than a vaccine diplomacy? Is this a chance for China to become even more active in Africa and uh, finance some of the recovery beyond what already has been um, uh, financed? So how do you see the role of China in Africa going forward? And then we'll go back to Amelia. There are some questions on, um, on um, FDI in specific sectors. Is it going to be part again of the financing the recovery? Um, on the vaccine diplomacy, I'll just make one quick comment that um, health diplomacy for China has been a feature of their political engagement with the continent since the 1960s. So <laughs> they have a long, long history of this and it's, you know, you can put a BRI label on it, but it really, you know, it's, it's an old, um, old and longstanding form of, of diplomatic uh, relations between those ties and one uh, important uh, if small part of their foreign aid program. Um, but on the, the speculation that China will pull out of Africa, we're not seeing that at all. Um, we are seeing you know, continued interest in lending, although it's changing. So the, the forms are changing, we're seeing, and, and it's an evolution. So what's happened in the early years is the policy banks, uh, particularly the Export Bank and SIDCA, the Ministry of <clears throat> Commerce, they took the lead role. They're pulling companies in, they're, they're uh, building the business, helping <coughs> smooth the, the risks and, 
get them into these markets. And then the companies are in there and they start taking off on their own. So that's it's something I've been writing about for a couple of decades now, um, but that's what we see. And so now the companies are there and the, the banks are there. And so they're gonna be, they're finding their own way and building their own business. And so we're seeing that happening. So it's gonna be probably less led. I mean, there's an evolution. I think the policy bank lending peaked except for Angola, which is, you know, it's a lot that's refinancing. There, there's some uh, defensive lending going on in Angola. It's like Venezuela. So it's really different. Uh, but in the other places, the policy banks, policy banks, particularly Exxon Bank will be pulling back and these other commercial entities will be taking over. And that's what we see in, in our research. So it's going to be, and we see an interesting emphasis on continued to move production capacity out of China and into other parts of the world. And so Africa is one part of that. So the, the value chains that we've been talking about, the Chinese uh, actors are very interested in that. They're in Ethiopia in particular, they've been investing um, in this, in research that we published uh, a couple of years ago at this point now in the Africa Economic Research, uh, Africa Economic, Africa Economic Research Review. <laughs> uh, but in any case, what we were looking at was, um, the nature of Chinese FDI in the countries where there's the highest, this is in the manufacturing sector. And it was import substitution, but not the old kind. This is uh, producing in Africa what used to be being produced in China and then doing it for the local market and also for the regional market. So that's an interesting trend that, that we've also been, been working on and, and writing about. So there's an evolution it's going into more value added activities. There are public private partnerships in the infrastructure sector that Chinese companies are exploring. So that there's a lot going on there. And we don't see um, uh, Chinese construction companies in 2019, they're still doing about $50 billion worth of business. So that's, that's changed very little. And uh, it's gonna continue because the infrastructure deficit in Africa is so huge. And the Chinese companies are the best position to, to go into that market. Very interesting. Uh, Amelia, there were some questions as to the nature of uh, foreign direct investment. Is that changing? Uh, perhaps it's too early, but how do you see it uh, sectorally, not in terms of sources of which countries, but sectorally is there a shift? And also perhaps to Ariana after that, do we see uh, more investment going in green of the economy? This is uh, from one of our participants. Thanks for the for the question. As I mentioned, most of the FDI into the continent is still into renewables and into what is the commodity sector, the primary sector. So that turnaround as and this uh, infrastructure deficit, as Deborah mentioned, is a still uh, is a still a, an issue of concern. So in terms of recipient uh, sectors, recipient of uh, of, uh, of investment is mostly the, the primary sector. But uh, I mean, recently, because of the pandemic, there were new avenues that opened. I mean, it doesn't, it is not a, a significant in terms of ratio as, uh, as the, the oil sector or the commodity sector, but um, healthcare, healthcare also evidenced some uh, important increases in terms of foreign direct investment. And it went for a low of around 40, 40 million to 125 million investment in the health sector. So there is some hope that this trend will remain to invest not only on the on the medicine side, but also on the productive capacity side of the of the health sector. And uh, another trend that was mostly evident in Asia, but also uh, when we look at the data in Africa, was the increase in the ICT sector. Uh, digital and technology also uh, experience a significant increase of foreign investment. So again, the hope is that this trend can continue and that the, the process of uh, intra-regional integration and GDC restructuring and regionalization could help to attract more of this type of investment uh, away from the traditional uh, resource-seeking FDI type of sectors. Thank you. Um, Ariana, there was a question on whether in the crisis we see, uh, I should mention that your team works with households, but also with businesses. So you actually have done a lot of recent uh, research in that regard. Can you comment? Yeah, perhaps um, uh, not a full view on that, um, but 
one uh, one point I think, which is that you know if we look at uh, social impact investing, if we're looking at kind of private sector becoming uh, more willing to report on uh, on green uh, from the corporate side, and as you know, as the whole world is moving quickly um, right now to um, implement better policies for developed countries we don't see necessarily the same happening in uh, in Africa and in general in the developing world. Uh, and sometimes uh, African countries are the recipient of the old technologies that the European regulations throws out of Europe. Uh, vehicles is a very good example of that. Um, and so, you know, we need to, uh, I think uh, African countries need to think what they need to do from their side to protect themselves from just being the recipient of, you know, high emission cars that create pollution that then create, you know, respiratory issues for their populations and so forth and so on and kind of in a downward spiral. Um, and, and think about uh, kind of their tax, tax and tariff policies and regulation uh, to help them kind of move at the same pace with, with the rest of the world. Uh, one, one recent study on Uganda shows that uh, when the Ugandan government increased tariffs for older vehicles, um, the, the stock of old vehicles in the country was uh, sufficiently high uh, that it didn't really have the effects um, that uh, we hoped for or the government hoped for. Um, so kind of also building capacities within countries um, to to deal with these issues. Now, in, in that particular case, kind of moving to like e-vehicles, the, the issues are so much larger than just the production of e-vehicles. Um, most countries, including developed countries, do not have the infrastructure uh, and the linkages between the energy and, and transport to ensure that there is in fact clean generation of electricity first, uh, and then just the infrastructure, the whole supply chain of having an e-vehicle function in an African context, including charging stations and everything else. Uh, this is not, not a small investment in a transition. So we, we, I think as a community, as a development community, we need to think more carefully what will be needed for these countries to jump. Indeed, uh, it's actually an issue in the whole world. Uh, Africa, in some sense, uh, is part of a, uh, of a global question of how do you go about, uh, about this uh, economy. We are now going to have a final round of uh, concluding uh, comments. Uh, and uh, on the chat, we've uh, received some, um, some further thoughts. Uh, but let me uh, be perhaps more provocative, or at least forward-looking, and ask each of you, starting with Deborah, then Amelia, then Ariana. On a year from now, given uh, your, your work in this volume, which I remind is already available online uh, for uh, the book. Uh, we are not hearing you very well, Simeon. Given the talk that you've... Sorry. Um, Sorry. Um, Dealing with, with the technology. technology, a year, a from, year now, from now, what would we be um, uh, dealing with um, in the particular um, area that you've uh, that you're working on? So, what would be the questions that uh, people would be asking us? And if you can summarize with that uh, your your work, starting with Deborah and then uh, Amelia and then Ariana, please. Uh, thanks for that, that final question. It's always uh, hard to be a soothsayer for the future, but I'll do my best. Um, I think the main uh, issue when it comes to Chinese lending is, are, is this going to be an insolvency problem or a liquidity problem? And how, how, when will we know that? And so what we could see leading up to the pandemic was that there were some countries that were heading toward insolvency problems. And I would say Zambia is a good example of that. And then Zambia just really managed its borrowing poorly. And you can see that both with the bond uh, holders and, and taking out, with, they're going into this frontier market to get really good returns, which were going up to about 20% for, for them trading on the secondary market. And then Chinese lenders also, the same thing, going into this risky market and thinking that they could 
uh, Zambia is not going to be able to repay all of those lenders. So that's a case of insolvency. But then Angola, I think it may be uh, more a case of liquidity. So if the oil price does recover, if we do go into a, a super commodity cycle, um, then Angola is going to recover. And uh, the, the interesting graphs that we have about Chinese lending and the amount of oil that they're sending uh, from Angola to China, there's a, a very large margin um, in good times for covering those loans amply. So that really is going to shape a lot of when we look at the whole continent. And then on this, the other countries where Chinese lending is a um, smaller percentage, I think they're going to be um, muddling through what happens, uh, muddling through for the next period, the next year and so on. It's not, uh, the Chinese are not a big factor in most of the continent, surprisingly. Um, they are in a small number of important countries, seven or eight. Um, but I suspect that if the recovery does happen quickly enough that uh, we're going to go back to more of uh, business as usual. And in a few countries, we're going to be seeing some Chinese haircuts, which had never happened before. Thank you, Deborah. Amelia, FDI a year from now, what is the prospect for Africa? The prospect for Africa, well, the question is, did FDI finally help for to transformation and to meet development goals? And at what was the role of FDI in sustainable recovery in the continent? Uh, did FDI expand it beyond infrastructure, uh, beyond what we, is uh, the traditional transport infrastructure, in utilities and renewable to other areas like food security, health and education? This is my question one year from now. Also, uh, I'm glad that um, it was mentioned before that uh, the issue of uh, corporate social responsibility and environmental and social governance, we saw a huge uh, expansion of sustainability funds and COVID related funds and bonds during the pandemic, but these uh, resources didn't reach Africa. So how can we make the absorptive capacity and institutional capacity of these countries uh, improve, how they can improve to be able to absorb uh, sustainability finance beyond traditional portfolio and foreign direct investment. Uh, these are my two key questions and, and uh, hopefully the, this downturn that uh, doesn't have a full recovery on the, on, uh, on the horizon uh, will not derail the development prospect of Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and Ariana, um, a year from now, how's, how does the African economy look, uh, households, uh, businesses, uh, what are the issues that we will be grappling with still? My list is so long, I am not sure where to start, but I'll pick a couple of things. Um, so the first thing I'd like to pick is the efficiency in government function um, and huge demand that we have uh, experienced during the crisis for a uh, policymaker to receive real-time information on what they should be acting on. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, tax authorities, procurement agencies, head justices, and you know, the, the huge innovation that has happened during the crisis on, on the research side to be able to respond to these demands using transaction level, high frequency data from administrative data from these agencies and really kind of figuring out how to make them more efficient, more able to um, find the fiscal space and target uh, the more important um, things for them to do in justice, doing e-justice, in, uh, in uh, tax, figuring out, uh, as we discussed earlier, the sectors and the, the, uh, that need support from the e-procurement improving uh, the efficiency in procurement of pharmaceuticals, et cetera. That's one area I think that will not go away and will grow quite a bit. And the, num and the questions that we'll be able to answer in the future with uh, greater and greater access to these type of data will be, um, um, I think, something to watch. Um, the second area that I'll pick uh, is uh, <laughs> private sector. And what is happening in Africa today uh, is reflective of what is happening in the rest of the world with disruptive technologies and uh, platforms that are helping to uh, 
um, improve the efficiency of markets meeting demand and supply constraints and contributing to making uh, those markets more efficient. With the, with the social distancing and lockdowns, uh, we have seen an increase in uh, the number of, um, of, of um, in the labor market connecting to international jobs and being able to um, kind of working remotely. Uh, this is something that Africa can do. <laughs> And we need to invest in the uh, both supporting, um, in particular in some countries, some very vibrant um, technology innovators and move and help them uh, really uh, improve the efficiency in the, in the local market. Just an example of that is Africa has the highest transport cost in the world with 50% load for trucks on average instead of the 90 to 100% in other regions. Um, this is something that can be addressed um, by truckers finding loads back to bring back to where they came from, um, kind of you know decreasing transport costs by half, contributing to uh, climate sustainable growth and, and, uh, and the likes. Uh, we are working with a platform like Jumia that is present in 15 plus countries, uh, really providing um, the same type of uh, services that things like Amazons and others are providing in the rest of the world. Uh, these are, uh, I think, high stake and high, um, uh, high potential areas that we can work with. Thank you very much, Ariana, Amelia, Deborah. Thank you also for your contributions to the to the book, which is already available online. And thank you, by the way, to CETR, who uh, very graciously provided a platform both for this uh, for this event and for um, uh, for the book. Um, thank you also for everybody who participated uh, uh, today. Uh, and uh, maybe we see each other a year from now to see where our forecasts and uh, thoughts have. Um, helped in this uh, African uh, recovery. Thank you all. Bye-bye.